All right, so thanks so much, everyone, for the opportunity to speak with you all at this critical moment in, uh, in the nation. Uh, I'm going to share a few minutes of my thoughts on economic opportunity in the COVID-19 era. And I'm going to show you some data that we've been tracking on our team here at Opportunity Insights at Harvard on how COVID-19 is affecting economic opportunity in the U.S. But I want to start by contextualizing this moment by giving you a historical perspective on where we are now uh, in the U.S. in terms of the landscape of opportunity relative to historical trends. And so I'll start with this chart here, uh, which shows you a simple measure of whether kids are able to achieve the American dream in the United States. And so what we're doing here is measuring the American dream by the fraction of children who go on to earn more than their parents did, measuring both kids and parents' incomes in their mid-30s and adjusting for inflation. And what you can see here is that back in uh, the 1940s and 1950s for kids born at that time, it was a virtual guarantee that they were going to achieve the American dream of moving up. 92% of kids born in 1940 went on to earn more than their parents did. But if you look at what has happened over time, you see a dramatic fading of the American dream, such that for kids born in the 1980s, as you can see here, uh, only about 50% of kids go on to earn more than their parents did. And so that aspiration that we all have, I think that America is a land where through hard work, anyone has a shot of going on to do better than their parents did. Unfortunately, I think that's no longer the case. It's essentially now a coin flip as to whether kids have a shot at achieving the American dream. And so in our research group at Harvard, uh, what we've been focused on even prior to the COVID crisis is what is driving this dramatic trend, which is of course of great economic and social and political interest, uh, and trying to understand what we might be able to do going forward to give more kids and especially kids from lower income families better chances of rising up in the income distribution. Now we've conducted a series of studies on that question. One key starting point in uh, what we've found uh, is that there's tremendous variation in kids' chances of being able to rise up in the income distribution, depending upon where they live. And so if you look at this map here, you can see the geography of upward mobility in the United States. The way we construct this map is by using data on 20 million kids born in the early 1980s, mapping them back to where they grew up, and asking where did they themselves end up in the income distribution when we measure their incomes at age 35, conditional on growing up in a low-income family, a family earning $27,000 a year. And what you can see if you look at this map is there are dramatic differences across areas in kids' chances of rising up. In places like Dubuque, Iowa, or much of the center of the country, uh, the rural Midwest, you see that kids starting out in families making $27,000 a year are ending up with average incomes of $45,000 a year one generation later, so tremendous upward mobility. By contrast, if you look at other places like Charlotte, North Carolina, for example, kids who grew up in comparably low-income families there, they're ending up with average incomes in adulthood of only $26,000 a year uh, in adulthood. So essentially no progress across one generation. And so motivated by this map, we've been very focused on how we can understand uh, what is driving these differences across places with an eye towards figuring out how we might be able to increase upward mobility in the places where upward mobility is currently lower in the United States. Now, there are a variety of different theories that one might have for why upward mobility varies so much across these areas. One explanation that might immediately come to your mind, often comes to mind for economists, is that maybe this is about differences in the types of jobs that are available in different places. So perhaps the types of jobs that are available in uh, you know, the Bay Area and the tech sector are different from other parts of the country, and maybe it's access to those jobs that are driving differences in upward mobility. But what you can see when you look at this map, you know, right away, if you take an example like Charlotte, which I was talking about before, you can see that that explanation is unlikely to be the, the driving factor. Charlotte, as you might know, is one of the engines of job growth in the United States. It's one of the fastest growing cities in terms of rates of job growth and wage growth. Yet, when you look at Charlotte, in terms of rates of upward mobility for the kids who grew up there, it ranks 50th out of the 50 largest cities in the US. Low and middle income kids who grow up in Charlotte really don't have a good shot of rising up. Now, more broadly, if we look across the US at rates of upward mobility shown on the vertical axis here, 
versus job growth rates from 1990 to 2010, and look at the relationship across here, the 30 largest metro areas, you can see that there's essentially no relationship between those two things. You have places like Charlotte and Atlanta that have incredibly high job growth rates, but very low levels of upward mobility. Conversely, you have a number of other cities that have lower job growth rates, but have very high rates of upward mobility. And so the answer doesn't fundamentally seem to be about jobs. Rather, what we found is the answer really revolves around childhood development. What is the environment in which kids are growing up? And the places that are having higher levels of upward mobility are places that are fostering better outcomes for kids in the long run, developing their human capital more effectively. Now, what are they doing to do that? Well, that is the central focus of our research at the moment, trying to figure out what makes some neighborhoods and cities higher mobility than others. And we've looked at a variety of different factors and identified four really strong predictors of these differences in upward mobility across areas. Just to briefly summarize them here, we find that places with lower poverty rates, so more mixed income areas, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. Places with more stable family structures, that is more two-parent families, for instance, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. Somewhat related to that, places with greater social capital. So think of a place like Salt Lake City, where uh, there's canonical wisdom that through the Mormon church uh, and other resources, even if you're not doing well, someone else is likely to help you out. Places that look like that in terms of social capital tend to have high levels of upward mobility. And finally, perhaps as you might expect intuitively, places with better schools uh, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. So education is closely related to differences in upward mobility across areas. So these set of factors, they show you that the drivers of upward mobility are quite broad. It's not just about education. It's not just about segregation in cities. It's about a variety of different factors. Uh, and what we're doing now is trying to understand in more detail exactly what types of systems of education can provide the greatest pathways for upward mobility. What does it mean to have higher levels of social capital and how might you be able to manipulate the level of social capital to increase social capital in a given area? Now, all of that was kind of the, where we were in terms of our research before COVID hit. When the COVID shock hit, our team pivoted towards trying to understand how this crisis affects economic opportunity in the U.S., and what its implications are going forward, both in the short run and the longer run. And so I want to conclude here by showing you what we're finding on that front. We've developed a new tool called the Economic Tracker, which you can go to uh, on a website called tracktherecovery.org. And what we've done there is assembled a new set of data from private companies that allows us to track in a very precise way what's happening to key indicators in the economy, like employment rates, uh, like spending, like how much kids are learning in schools and so forth. And so to give you a quick sense of what we're seeing there, this chart here uses data from payroll companies covering millions of workers in America to show you what happened when COVID hit to employment rates across the income distribution. And what you can see is that for people in the bottom wage quartile, there was an enormous loss of jobs, 37% of people working in jobs that paid less than $13 an hour, lost their jobs. That's about a 12 million uh, job loss. Uh, and then since uh, you know the COVID shock really hit in mid-April last year, there's been some recovery until about the middle of last year, after which uh, the recovery essentially stalled. Now, if you look at higher wage workers, you see a very different pattern. Some of you might've heard the term V-shaped recovery. And in fact, if you look at the plot here for the highest wage workers, it looks very much like a V where there was about a 13% job loss by mid-April, but then within about two months, you were back to pre-COVID levels of employment. And since that point, people at the top of the income distribution have basically had the same level of employment as they did pre-COVID. And so what this chart really shows you is that there's been a very different experience for low and high wage folks uh, when COVID hit. The crisis has persisted for lower income folks and continues to affect them now. Whereas for high wage folks, it was a relatively short lived crisis, um, which you know, might not also have lasting impacts going forward. So that is uh, you know, one example of how COVID I think has exacerbated some of the disparities in economic outcomes and opportunity in the US. 
I want to end by talking about another aspect, which I'm particularly concerned about going forward, which is thinking about how COVID has exacerbated disparities for kids. Uh, here, what we're doing is using data from an online math learning platform called Zern, which about 800,000 students use in the US as part of their regular curriculum. Uh, and what we're tracking here is how many lessons kids completed on the Zern platform, again, by income group for families in the top income quartile in the blue versus the bottom income quartile in the orange. And you see here, I think, a really heartbreaking pattern, which is when schools went remote in mid-March, April last year, for kids in the bottom income quartile, progress on math lessons fell drastically by, by about 60%, and there was very little recovery till the end of the school year. Whereas echoing what we saw on the employment front for high income kids, there was some immediate drop, but then a quick bounce back. Now, after the summer break in this school year, those disparities have unfortunately persisted. And even now you're seeing about a 20% gap in terms of the number of math lessons low income and high income kids are completing in the current environment. Now, 20%, that's a huge gap. That's like missing one day of school every week. Uh, and I think if you think about from our earlier research and other folks' research showing that early childhood education really plays a foundational role in kids' long-term outcomes, this is very worrisome in thinking about how these disparities might translate into long-term disparities in economic opportunity and in a sense a further erosion of the American dream where I started. And so to conclude, you know, I think we're at a really pivotal moment in this country already because of the 50-year trend that I showed you of the fading American dream, but now amplified by the current crisis. And while that might seem very disillusioning, I also think that an era of disruption like this, with such a major crisis, creates new opportunities to fundamentally rethink how we deliver education, how we organize our cities, how we train people in the labor market. And so I think there's tremendous potential going forward in terms of trying to improve outcomes, particularly thanks to modern data, where we can measure things very precisely and use evidence to better inform policies. And we look forward to working with all of you to achieve those better outcomes. Thanks very much.